Let's talk about what they don't tell you about dyspraxia. Now the purpose of this video is to promote awareness of dyspraxia. It is to provide guidance from many different perspectives, whether it's language of dyspraxia, what is dyspraxia, to dyspraxia and intelligence, plus more. The purpose here is to educate and to empower and hopefully promote the conversation on dyspraxia. So with that being said, let's analyze this train of thought and begin this journey. So the first thing we're gonna cover is dyspraxia being misunderstood. Now, a lot of people don't know what dyspraxia is. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Because if we don't know what something is, then it's understandable that it's misunderstood when it's presented. So let's explore some reasons. First, dyspraxia sounds phonetically similar to dyslexia. So the obvious misunderstanding is confusing dyslexia with dyspraxia. And secondly, dyspraxia as a term is just misunderstood. And others concur, dyspraxia is not fully understood in the public consciousness. As one website states, quote, dyspraxia is not well understood by the general public and is less commonly diagnosed than specific learning disabilities like dyslexia and ADHD, end of quote. So if we accept this premise, then the question is why? Why is it not well understood? I suspect there is a funding issue around raising awareness, but this is speculation on my behalf. And another question that I think has some merit is, is there a responsibility for pushing awareness of dyspraxia if it is misunderstood? Meaning, is this an important issue for the public? And if that's true, who has this responsibility to promote awareness? Is it schools? Is it government? Is it charities? Is it medical institutions, i.e. your GP? Is it families? This can lead to other questions such as, is this a legal responsibility or is it an ethical responsibility or is it both? And this leads to new questions. What is dyspraxia? And how can we promote awareness on this issue? And why is dyspraxia not promoted like other neurodiverse conditions? And from where I'm standing, the premise that dyspraxia is misunderstood appears to be a very strong one. Now, the second thing we will cover is the language of dyspraxia. And here is a premise. Our human evolution is partly based on language. Indeed, human beings evolved into social animals. Indeed, Robert Greene mentions human beings as social animals in the book Mastery. I believe the statement is, quote, we humans are the preeminent social animal, end of quote. And part of us being social beings is using communication. And this is all part of the social intelligence matrix. And you may be asking, how? How is this relevant? And my response to that, or my initial response to that, would be, well, okay, how do we define dyspraxia? Because on one level, we call it dyspraxia, but on another level, it is neurodiversity. But then again, we may call it a hidden impairment. And some may use different language, such as a disability, or is it a learning difficulty? And perhaps it's a combination of all of these things. Or maybe it's more appropriate to call it DCD, which is an acronym for Developmental Coordination Disorder. And this leads to more questions, like how do we define dyspraxia in the legal context? A disability makes a worker with dyspraxia eligible for reasonable adjustments in the workplace. So is dyspraxia a legal disability on one hand, but a hidden impairment on the other? If we say dyspraxia is not a disability, then a worker is not protected by the Equality Act in the working environment. And that premise or conclusion would seem unreasonable and unfair. And I'm not making no definitive statements here. I'm just asking questions. And additional to this, I would argue that disability and neurodiversity can have different connotations. Some may argue that disability has negative connotations while neurodiversity has positive connotations, or at least it has more positive connotations. And perhaps some people may argue the other way. And just like a game of chess, 
there is an element of complication here. So at the very least, the language component of dyspraxia deserves some attention and thought. So the third important thing is, what is dyspraxia? And if you went up to someone and asked, what is dyspraxia? I would assume that you may not get the correct answer. Now the variable to getting the correct answer would be asking someone who has dyspraxia or they pull out their phone and type into Google, what is dyspraxia? But despite these variables, I think it's quite a safe assumption to have the premise that a lot of people do not know what dyspraxia is. So I'm gonna define dyspraxia in four phases. Phase one, in one sentence, dyspraxia is a condition that affects movement and coordination. Phase two, if we slightly expound on that definition, dyspraxia affects gross motor and fine motor skills. Phase three, to address this specifically, this affects riding a bike, skipping with rope, drawing, painting, swimming, walking, using a knife and fork, tying your shoelaces, and much, much more. And finally, phase four. This can go even further because dyspraxia can affect posture, issues with speech, issues with self-confidence, it can affect perception, it can cause lack of awareness within spatial relationships, and it can affect concentration amongst other things. Now in one video I use the analogy of the Rubik's Cube. It may be a crude analogy, but basically a Rubik's Cube is often seen as something that is complex. And dyspraxia can have a layer of complexity when we put it under the magnifying glass. And that four phase definition kind of indicates the layer of complexity. And of course we can elaborate on this definition, but I would suggest that it's important to understand the definition. And some may ask the question, who is it important to? And I would ask the following questions to that question. Well, is it not important to people that have dyspraxia? Is it not important to families that may have children that have dyspraxia? Is it not important to your doctor to be able to recognize the symptoms of dyspraxia? Is it not important to the educational system to give the dyspraxic learner a fair chance at being successful at academia? Is it not important for people to understand dyspraxia so that they can further understand the people that have dyspraxia? In my world, what is dyspraxia is an important question and it may be important in your world as well. Now the fourth thing we're gonna discuss is dyspraxia and short-term memory. So the important preface here is what is short-term memory? So here is a statement, quote, short-term memory is the capacity to store small amounts of information for a short period of time, end of quote. Short-term memory, to my understanding, relies a lot on the prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain. But let's not get sidetracked by the science and let's look at this practically. Because someone with dyspraxia may suffer with short-term memory and this can lead to the unintended consequence of not remembering someone's name. This one on a personal level gets me all the time. Because when I meet someone for the first time, I can never remember their name. Now according to Dale Carnegie, he wrote the book How to Win Friends and Influence People, remembering someone's name is important for social intelligence. But this simple task can become a barrier with someone that has dyspraxia. And I struggle to remember so many things, whether it's phone numbers. If you tell me a phone number, I will not be able to remember it. And I will struggle to remember quotes. I mean, I really love some of the statements of Oscar Wilde. You know, the quote, true friends stab you in the front, end of quote. Or another one of my favorites, quote, be yourself, everyone else is taken, end of quote. And these statements can be great references for social situations because in a sense they are philosophical and witty and most of us can relate to them. But I wouldn't be able to remember them because dyspraxia can affect short-term memory and that's the point that I'm making. And you know, in the most recent context, this affected me when I was playing Mortal Kombat. Because when I'm playing this game, I can never remember how to do the finishing moves. So when I win and it says finish him or finish her, I pause the screen, I take a deep breath, I go to the menu options, 
I look at the moves list and then I still struggle to pull it off. Who would have thought that short term memory can affect your Mortal Kombat experience? But all jokes aside, I believe that there is a connection between short term memory and dyspraxia and I think it's important to understand this relationship. And also it's important to look at solutions to effectively manage your short term memory. So the fifth thing I want to discuss is dyspraxia and intelligence. And dyspraxia and intelligence may be a controversial issue. And it's a dangerous question or potentially a dangerous question. Does dyspraxia positively or negatively affect intelligence or is it neutral? But let's form a different question. And that question is, what is intelligence? Now, when I think of intelligence, I think of certain people. I think of Einstein. I think of Thomas Sowell. I think of Dr. Craig Richards. I think of Idris Sandu. I think of Oscar Wilde. I think of Neil deGrasse Tyson and the list goes on. But that list does not define intelligence. And to be concise, there are different types of intelligence. And there are actually nine categories of intelligence. So let's name those categories. So category number one, verbal linguistic intelligence. Category number two, mathematical intelligence. Category number three, musical intelligence. Category number four, visual spatial intelligence. Category number five, bodily kinesthetic intelligence. Category number six, interpersonal intelligence. Category number seven, intrapersonal intelligence. Notice the difference there, interpersonal and intrapersonal. Category number eight, naturalistic intelligence. And finally, category number nine, existential intelligence. Now we don't have enough time to define these terms, so I would suggest you do your own research if you want to get greater context. Now I think asking, does dyspraxia affect intelligence is the wrong question. And the reason for this is that it's too broad because if we accept the premise that someone with dyspraxia can have a high IQ, then this kind of destroys the question. Because if we're honest, the question has a negative connotation. Because one can assume that if it affects dyspraxia, it can affect it in a negative way. But if we're being truly neutral or truly objective, surely we should consider that dyspraxia could affect it in a positive way. This leads to another significant point. We need to ask better questions and we need to take responsibility for the questions that we ask. So let's answer the question in a different way. Because from my perspective, someone with dyspraxia can have high IQ. They could be a great chess player, which would involve mathematical intelligence. They could be a great musician like Mozart, meaning they have great musical intelligence. And similar to the philosopher Albert Camus, they could have great existential intelligence. And the point here is that you should not let the label dyspraxia define the limits of your intelligence. Because I think there's a credible argument to state that generally speaking, dyspraxia and intelligence are separate entities. So this is my conclusion. So we've spoken about many topics within the dyspraxia universe. So let's give a recap. And I'm going to do this in phases. So phase one, the premise that dyspraxia is misunderstood seems very solid. Phase number two, the language of dyspraxia has layers. Some may use the language that dyspraxia is complex. Phase three, we have given a four phase definition of dyspraxia. This is a good starting point for understanding this condition. Phase four, there is a relationship between dyspraxia and short-term memory. We need to understand this and then try and seek solutions. And finally, phase five, with regards to dyspraxia and intelligence, we need to ask better questions, but we have a premise that people with dyspraxia can have high IQs and have high intelligence. And with that being said, I sincerely hope this video has provided value.